Before we begin, I want to talk about uh, Women Who Code. Uh, our mission is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. Uh, we are a community uh, to uh, make sure we envision a world where diverse women are better represented as engineers and tech leaders. Uh, we want to support technical professionals with two or more years of experience to strengthen their influence and level up in their careers. And for today, uh, we are kickstarting our seven part uh, webinar series. I say seven part because the eighth part is a panel discussion where we will be talking about career and how statistics is important and everything. Uh, but for the uh, webinar itself, uh, we have seven parts where we start with exploratory data analysis. Um, this is the base for most of, most, not most, all of uh, machine learning projects and we uh, eventually dive into all forms of machine learning and how statistics is very important in both supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, our uh, webinar is going to happen every Saturday at the same time uh, right now. Uh, and thank you for being uh, present for today's session. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, before we begin again, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor. If you want to show some love, uh, Aryan would be sharing a link to Twitter. Uh, you can share it to sub show your support. Um, and I also want to give a huge shout out to our volunteers. Uh, Rishika, Aryan, and Shavia are present with us today, and they'll be the ones who will be taking care of uh, Q&A and doing all the back end uh, volunteering. Uh, super happy to have you all guys here. Thank you for all your support. And uh, this webinar series uh, moved progressed fast because of all of these wonderful uh, people. Um, and for today's uh, series, uh, we have Jane, who is going to take over exploratory data analysis. And to talk a little bit on Jane, she is a data enthusiast and she is building her career as a data scientist. She has more than two years of experience teaching Python, and she is currently pursuing her master's in applied mathematics, and she also works as a data analyst. And she is a STEM mentor, and she strives to support women and girls who wants to pursue a career in STEM. Uh, give a thumbs up for her. And also, um, Aryan would be sharing more links uh, for you to join our community. Um, yes, uh, so we are excited to have you here, Jane. Uh, before we hand it over to you, I also want to uh, just give a quick uh, roundup of things to do. Uh, so before we begin, uh, we uh, have a collab notebook for you. So you might want to start by clicking on the first link, which is collab.research.google.com. So our collaboratory notebook would be here. Uh, so the link to code is here uh, in GitHub and the link to data is here. If you have downloaded the PDF, you should have this by now. Uh, otherwise, Aryan would be sharing it uh, in the chat as well. So you can either type in collab.research.google.com or click on this link and it will lead you to this page. Uh, can you let us know when you have reached this point so we can tell you what the next steps are? Yeah, you can give a thumbs up and that would be good. Awesome, looks like uh, everyone has reach this point. Um, the next thing you want to do is click on this link to code. Uh, make sure you just copy the link and do not uh, try opening it because it's going to lead you to the GitHub page. So all you have to do is click on that link, come here, and you will have a lot of tabs here. So you want to go to GitHub and type in your link and press the search uh, icon. You should be able to see all of these. Um, if you scroll all the way down, you should be able to find the notebook that reads statistics and data science, uh, one exploratory data analysis Python notebook. So all you have to do is click on this page. Um, yeah, one of our um, audience is having some issues. So all you have to do first is go to collab.research.google.com and once you click on it, you should be seeing this page where you can go to the GitHub tab and 
The second link is linked to code, which you can copy and paste here, where you will see all the uh, notebooks. Uh, the link was shared in the chat, so you should be able to find it. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so once you see this, you can start by clicking on it and it will open that notebook. So you should all have this page now. Cool. And the next thing is the data itself. So we have the data here. So all you have to do is just click on it. Uh, the third link and you should be able to see this. You can start by downloading the data. All links are present in slide seven of the PDF that was sent earlier. Uh, if you haven't opened it, Aryan has shared it in the chat as well. So once you have downloaded the data, uh, you go here and you connect to a runtime. Uh, so if you wait for it, you should be able to see this. So you click on this folder icon and you open this page. And once you have this, You can have this upload to session storage icon. Once you click on this, you should be able to see uh, your uh, data wherever you have downloaded. For me, it's in downloads. So I'm just gonna click on this to upload it. And it's gonna give us a reminder and that's okay. Uh, you can just click on okay to load the data. So we'll give two more minutes uh, for everyone to set it up. Uh, once you guys are in here, you should be able to follow along with Jane. And uh, yes. Um, so all the links are here. Uh, the first one is for Google Collab, which you have to open. The second link is the, to the GitHub repo itself, which you can use to open this one. And the third link is the data itself, which you can just download it and upload. Uh, the reminder where it says it will be deleted in runtime, it's okay. That is just a reminder that says that it will uh, purge the data. That's okay. You can just click on okay. The file that's uh, the file is so. The file will read uh, exploratory data analysis. Anyway, uh, I think most of you have got it. So we are going to uh, let Jane take over the screen and start. Uh, the series. Thank you. Um, Jean, can you take over the series? Oh, you're muted. Thank you, Sneha, for the introduction and um, Women Who Code for putting together this series and give me the opportunity to participate. Um, I'm actually nervous. This is like my first online workshop and hopefully we will learn together. So it's actually 6, 11 p.m. in Nigeria where I am. And I'll just go ahead and um, share my screen and um, open up my notebook. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so does everyone have their notebooks open? Okay. 
please feel free to drop your questions or comment in the chat box so we can all learn together. And um, I would like to know um, the level of the participants. Can everyone just drop their levels in Python, beginners, intermediate, or advanced? Okay. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully for those in advanced level, you can also help in answering questions. <laughs> awesome. All right. So um, I'll just dive um, right in. And um, our topic for today is um, explore exploratory data analysis. And um, one of the most important skills that um, every data scientist must master is the ability to explore data properly. And this is where EDA, also known as exploratory data analysis, comes into play. You can also call it data exploration. So it's actually a step in the data analysis process where a number of techniques are actually used to explore data or to better understand the data set being used. And through ADA, it is essential in order to gather the integrity of your data and perform analysis. So in statistics, EDA is actually an approach to analyzing data sets to summarize their main characteristics and oftentimes with visual methods. You can decide to use a statistical model or not, but primarily what EDA does is for seeing what the data can tell us beyond the formal modeling. And then you may wonder how to get started after receiving a data set. This is where EDA comes to play. This is where EDA comes to the rescue. So EDA is not about making um, fancy visualizations or even pleasing ones. The goal is to try to answer questions with your data. So you should be able to um, create a figure which someone can look up in a couple of seconds and understand what is going on. If not, it's going to be too complicated. That is a visualization. And then you should try using something similar. In my own words, it's about knowing your data. You gain certain amounts of familiarity with the data before you start to extract insights from it. So EDA is understanding the data set by summarizing the main characteristics, often plotting them visually. Now, this step is very important when we arrive at uh, modeling the data in order to apply machine learning. And when it comes to plotting in EDA, it consists of histograms, box plots, scatter plots, and many more. So through the process of EDA, we can ask to define the problem statement or definition on our data, which is very important. Now, where is this particular data exploration in the data science process? Before we delve into EDA, it is important to uh, first get a sense of where EDA fits in the whole data science process. Looking at this chart I have here, um, a chart uh, from Wikipedia, you can see that after data is being collected, that is the raw data here, the data undergoes some processing, also called data cleaning. And after that, um, EDA is performed. Now notice that um, after EDA, we may go back to processing the data. So this can actually be an iterative process. Subsequently, we can use the cleaned data set to um, the knowledge gained to perform modeling. And at the end, we visualize and then communicate our report. We may ask why um, EDA, why do we need to explore our data? One, it actually helps us to clean up a data set. And secondly, it gives you a better understanding of the variables and the relationships between them. So um, we cannot talk about um, explore exploring our data sets without talking about the data itself. And of course, we have different types of data. We have um, structured data. 
we have structured data, unstructured data, service structured data. Please, can you see still my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, okay, that's fine. So structured data, uh, it's simply something that is well defined. It has a good structure and um, it is well ordered. Okay, now this kind of data can easily be assessed and read by humans and machine programs. And um, when, we, when, it talk, when it comes to structured data, it comprises of clearly defined data types, which make them searchable. And um, just a brief intro into um, unstructured data. So everything that is not structured comes under unstructured. And this particular data does not have predefined structure. It may often come or it may, it may include audio, video, images, file, and so on. And when, when we talk about unstructured data, it needs to be feature engineered before you perform ADE. And feature engineering is simply transforming noisy unstructured data to a structural format format. And then we also have semi-structured data, which is the third type of category. Now, going over or going back to our structured data, like I said, it's um, something that is organized and straightforward to analyze. And under structured data, we have numerical and categorical data. Numerical. Categorical data is also known as qualitative data, or you can call it a yes or no data. So it can represent um, a person's gender, marital status, hometown, or like the type of movies they like. And um, it can take on um, numerical values such as one, let's say indicating a male, and then two indicating female. But these numbers do not have any mathematical meaning because you cannot add them together. So categorical data takes only a fixed set of values, such as uh, say a type of screen or the name of a state. And under categorical data, there are nominal and ordinal data types. Nominal data is a type of data that is used to label variables without providing any quantitative value. It is actually the simplest form of a scale of measure. So nominal data cannot be ordered and cannot be measured. It can be analyzed using the grouping method. And these variables can be grouped together into categories. And for each category, the frequency or percentage can be calculated. Now, when we talk about ordinal data, it's actually a mix of numerical and categorical data. The data fall into categories, but numbers placed on these categories have meaning. Now, for example, now you might go to a restaurant and after eating, you are given a feedback form to fill, to raise the restaurant, let's say from zero, which is the lowest, to four or five, which is the highest. Doing that gives ordinal data. And sometimes ordinal data are treated as categorical, where um, the groups are ordered when graphs and charts are made. However, unlike um, categorical data, the numbers do have mathematical meaning, okay? So if you survey like 100 people and then ask them to rate a restaurant on a scale from zero to four, if you take the average of the 100 responses, it will have a meaning. This will not be the case with categorical data. And the main difference between nominal and ordinal data is that ordinal data has an order of categories while nominal data does not. Um, okay, so um, that is it about, now the next, um, we also have another type of data which is called the binary data. Binary data is like a special um, class of um, categorical data. So you can also call it logical data, you can call it um, indicator, you can call it a, a boolean. So it takes only one of two values, such as zero or one, yes or no, true or false. We'll look at this more when we, when we move. The second type of data is um, numerical data. Numerical data can also be called quantitative data. These data have meaning as a measurement, such as a person's height, weight, IQ, or blood pressure. It is simply something that is measurable. 
it is always collected in number form and or accounts such as the number of stock shares a person owes how many seeds a dog has or how many pages of your favorite book you read before you fall asleep and nominal data can uh, numerical data beg your pardon can further be broken down into two types which is discrete data and continuous data discrete data can also be called integer or count so it represents items that can be counted they take on possible values that can be listed out the list of possible values may be fixed um, also called finite or it may go from one to infinity making it countably finite for example the number of heads in 100 coin flips takes on values from zero to 100 which is finite okay but the number of flips needed to get 100 heads it can take up value from 100 up to infinity because you may, you may never get to that 100 heads now continuous data can also be called interval floats or uh, numeric. So it's actually a data that can take on any value in an interval. It represents um, measurements, the uh, possible values cannot be counted and it can only be described using intervals on the real number line. For example, say the exact um, amount of gas you purchased um, for your car with 20 gallon tanks, it cannot, you, you cannot really count that particular data. You can only measure it like on a scale or on an interval. Okay. And um, another example would be like the lifetime of a battery. So the lifetime of a battery cannot really be measured. You can just say it's from, let's say zero hours to a particular number of hours. That's if it lasts, if it lasts um, forever because you don't expect a battery to last more than a few hundred hours. Now, why do we bother about um, the taxonomy of data types? Why do we bother about different um, data types? It turns out that for the purpose of data analysis and then um, predictive modeling, the data type is um, important to help determine the type of visual display data analysis, or even the model that you use. Now, knowing that data is categorical can actually act as a signal telling the software how procedures and statistics, such as uh, producing a chart or fitting a model should behave. Now, um, we are going to be working on a data set and on an automobile data set for our exploratory data analysis. And I'm sure we all have our data sets ready. Now, there are some libraries that we need to import or very important libraries that we need to use when performing um, data exploration. Uh, we have different types of libraries, scientific computing libraries in Python, we have visualization libraries, we have um, algorithmic um, libraries. So the first one, as you can see here, we have pandas. Pandas is simply for data structures and then tools. Then we have NumPy, also known as numerical Python, which is uh, for arrays and matrices. And then we have uh, Matplotlib. Matplotlib is a visualization library for visuals. And then we use it to plot for plots and graphs. It is most popular for plots and graphs. And then we have um, Seaborn. Seaborn is based on Matplotlib. So in C1, C1 is actually like an advanced, um, an advanced matplotlib. We have different types of visuals such as heat maps, violin plots, time series, and so on. So we import the libraries by simply using the this um, the import function. You import pandas as pd, numpy as np, matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and C1 as mc. And then. Of course, you have to run this cell to um, import your libraries uh, properly. Now, the next thing is to load uh, the data set. Okay, so since our data set is a CSV file, we use the read um, CSV to load our data set. And then this dot head actually shows um, the first five rows of 
our data set. So this is our data set. And if you look at this data set, you discover that it comprises of both um, numerical and categorical data. So the, the typical frame of reference for an analysis in data science is a rectangular data object or database table, just like what we have here. And a data frame is also a rectangular data. So it's the basic data structure for statistical and machine learning models. Now, when it comes to data frames, we have some, um, some words or keywords that we use. We have features. Features are simply a column in the table. You can also call them attributes. You can call it input. You can call it predictor. You can call it variable. And then we have outcome. So many data science projects involve predicting an outcome. In this case, we want to predict price. Okay. And the features are sometimes used to predict the outcome in an experiment or study. So outcome is also called dependent variable. You can call it response. You can call it target. You can call it output. And in this data set, you can see some rows. So a row in the, in the table is commonly referred to as a record. It is also called case, um, example, instance, observation, pattern, sample, OK? And a rectangular data is actually a two-dimensional matrix with rows indicating records, also called cases, and columns indicating features. So the basic data structure in data science is a rectangular matrix in which the rows are records and columns are variables, also called features. In this data frame, there's a mix of uh, measure or counted data. We have a mix of numerical and categorical data. So you can see that this particular feature symboling is numeric. We have normalized losses as numeric. We have make as categorical and so on. So our data is both a mix of numeric and categorical data. Okay, so using the dot hedge um, function, it gives us the first um, five rows of our data with the heading. Now, looking at our data, you can discover that we have some missing um, data. So what we want to do here is to replace this question mark with NAN, which means null or not available. And then running this code, it replaces the question mark here. Now this in place simply means it's going to replace it in the same data frame, not in a different data frame, okay? And then um, looking at, after running the code, of course, you discover that we have replaced the question mark with this in the data. Now the next thing is um, we want to detect uh, the missing values. So the missing values in this data here, we want situation whereby where there are missing values, it will show true. And then where there are no missing value, it gives us false. Okay, so running this cell, we have this. Then the next line of code is we want to know the counts of um, the missing values in each column, the count of miss, missing value in each column. So value counts is um, actually um, a good way of understanding how many units of each characteristic or variable we have. And then looking at this, you can see the different missing values. So we have a total of 205 um, um, rows. And then looking at, um, uh, you can see that, um, like for this stroke, we have four missing values. For horsepower, there are two missing values, and um, and so on. We have missing values for price, and so on. Now, how do we um, treat missing values? So, missing values occur when no data value is um, is found for a variable. And how do you do with missing values? You can each, you can check with, um, with the, you can check the data collection source or you can drop the missing values. So in this case, we're going to be replacing the missing values with mean, that is for the numerical data. So under normalized losses, we have 41 missing data. So we replace it with mean. We have four missing data for stroke, which we replace it with mean. Same thing with bore, horsepower, and peak RPM. And then for frequency, 
we will we'll replace, um, for number of doors, we'll replace the missing values with the frequency. Okay, so since um, number of doors is, four doors is more frequent, it's likely that a particular one should occur. And then since we want to predict the price, we are going to simply drop um, the whole row because any data entry without price data cannot be used for prediction. Therefore, any row without price data is not useful to us. So we simply drop uh, the data set or drop the whole row. Okay, now um, as we know to deal with, uh, as we know to deal with our data, it's, there are actually a number of steps like data extraction, data cleaning, handling missing data, and so on. And statistics play a very important role in many of the steps. So we're going to start with a basic understanding of the role of central tendency method used during some of the steps. Now, what is central tendency? It's actually a measure of um, very basic but very useful functions in statistics that represents um, a central point or typical value of the data set. So it helps in indicating the point value, where the most value in the distribution falls. And the most common central tendency method used for analysis of numerical data are mean, uh, median, and mode. Now, mean is um, the most common and well-known method for measuring central tendency. And it can be used to handle both um, discrete and um, continuous data. So you can calculate the mean as the sum of all the values in the data set divided by the number of values in the data set. And this is uh, mathematically the formula for calculating mean. So this is actually summation of x. Okay, so x here um, actually stands for all the data in the set. And then n, n here is simply the number, okay? N is a sample size. So we have an example here. Suppose you randomly collected um, prices of pizza. So these are the prices of pizza and we want to compute this mean. We simply add all the prices and divide by six because there are six prices here. And then when we divide by six, we can see that the sample mean of the price of pizza is 80.83. Now the next um, central tendency is mode. So the mode of a data is um, the number with the highest frequency, number that appears most. And mode is mostly used if we have the data size having nominal or ordinal values in it. We can describe mode as the most frequently occurred value in the data set. Median is simply the middle value of your observation. Okay, so it's simply the middle, middle value of your observation when the values in the data set are ordered. So if you want to get the median, you have to arrange your data set from um, in either ascending order that is from big to uh, um, small to big or descending order that's from largest to smallest. And if the numbers of values in your data set is an odd number, then the middle number is the median. But if you have um, like two numbers in the middle, to get the median, you simply just take the average of the two median numbers. Like the, the example we have um, above, the median, um, we have actually have two numbers in the middle, which is it's one and one zero six. And to get the median, we add the numbers and divide by two. Now there's actually an alternative value that is resistance to outliers. When I mean outliers, outlier simply is a data value and is different from uh, most of the data. This alternative value is called trimmed mean. So a trimmed mean is a method of averaging that removes a small percentage of the largest and smallest values before calculating the mean. So after removing the specified outlier, um, which is like any value that is very distant from the other values in the data sets, 
the trimmed mean is found using like um, a standard arithmetic averaging formula. So like if you have a data set, you can decide to trim it, let's say to remove like 10% of it. So you have to arrange your, your data in um, from smallest to largest, and then you remove like the first 10%, then you remove the last 10%, and then you calculate the remaining um, mean of the data set. So like this are uh, actually um, estimates of um, location. Okay, so um, have another example here. And um, the example says at the Sky Rental Shop, data was collected on the number of rentals on each of 10 consecutive Saturdays. So looking at this data, I, I have a question for you all. Can you calculate the mean, median and mode for this data? Uh, please, when you do that, just let me know in the chat. Okay, so did anybody get it? Okay, the question is, the, can you calculate the mean, median, and mode for this data? The data is, um, okay, awesome. Okay, so we have awesome. So we have some responses already. So to calculate the mean, you simply um, add up and divide by 10 since we have um, 10 sample size or 10 data. So 49.2 is the mean of the data. And then to get the median, you first of all sort the median, you sort the data. So we have two numbers in the middle, 44 and 46, and then you simply add both together and divide by two. Awesome, nice response. Awesome, awesome responses. Thank you. All right, so um, oftentimes um, we actually want to know more, um, like location is just one dimension in summarizing a feature. Now, a second dimension is also, also referred to as dispersion of variability. Now, this measures whether the data values are tightly clustered or spread out. So even when the main median um, and mode do a nice job in telling where the center of the data set is, we are oftentimes interested in more. For example, let's say an engineer who works in a pharmaceutical company develops a new drug that regulates iron in the blood. And suppose she finds out that the average sugar content after taking the medication is the optimal level. This does not mean that the drug is effective. There is actually a possibility that half of the patients have dangerously low sugar content, while the other half have dangerously high content. Now, instead of the drug being an effective regulator, it is actually a deadly poison. What this pharmacist needs to do is to get a measure of how far the data is spread apart. And this is where variance and standard deviation comes into play. So the most widely used estimates of variation are based on the differences or deviations between the estimates of location and the observed data. These deviations tells us how this past um, the data is around uh, the central the central value. So talking about variance standard deviation, we'll first of all show the formulas, and I will go through the steps on how to use the formulas. Now this is the formula for the variance, and this is for standard deviation. So to get standard deviation, you simply square find the square roots of the variance. What this means here is you're subtracting the mean 
then you are trying to get a deviation from the mean. So you are subtracting each sample size from the mean to get the deviation. And then you simply divide by the sample size minus one. Now, these are the steps in calculating um, variance. You first of all calculate the mean, and then you write um, a table that subtracts the mean from each observed value. You square each of the differences, you add this column, and then you divide by n minus one, where n is the number of items in the sample. And to get the standard deviation, you simply find the square root of the variance. Now we have an example here. The owner of a restaurant is interested in how much people spend at the restaurant. He examines 10 randomly selected receipts for parties of four and writes down the following data. So this is the data that he was able to collect for parties, uh, receipts of parties. And then to get the mean, you simply add up this data and divide by the sample size, which is 10. And then we got the mean as 49.2. Now the next step is to get the deviation from the mean. So this table is actually showing the deviation. So in this case, the first um, data here is 44. So how does this deviate from the mean? So you simply subtract 49.2 from each of um, the data to get the deviation. And um, at this column here, we are basically squaring the values we got here to get this. And um, after doing that, you simply add it up to get this. And then you divide by the sample size minus one. So the sample size is 10 uh, minus one, which is nine. When you divide, you get 288.7. Approximating this, we have 289. So that is the variance. And to get the standard deviation, you simply find the square root, which is 17. Now, since the standard deviation can be thought of measuring how far the data values lie from the mean, we take the mean and move on standard deviation in either direction. So in this particular example, the mean was 49.2 and the standard deviation was 14. So when you subtract standard deviation from the mean, you get 32.2 and when you add it to the mean, you get 66.2. So what this means that um, for that particular um, data that was collected, it means that um, people actually spent between 32.20 and 66.20. Okay, um, so um, when it comes to variance and standard deviations, um, sometimes you, you can might get that the data um, lies close to the mean, and then this will make the standard deviation small. Okay, and then you might even have outliers which will increase the standard deviation. And one of the flaws involved with standard deviation is that it depends on the units that are used. One way you can actually handle this particular flaw or difficulty is using the coefficients of variance, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean times 100. So in the above example, we got our standard deviation as 17, and then we got the mean as 49.2. So when you divide this and then multiply by 100%, you get 34.6%. And this tells us that the standard deviation of the restaurant bills is actually 34.6% of the mean. Now, the last thing we want to look at is data cleaning, also called um, data preprocessing, um, or you can call it data wrangling. Now, since we actually have like a basic understanding of this um, statistics, we are going to be replacing um, the missing data with the main, just like um, we explained um, earlier. So these particular columns will be replacing the missing data with the main for normalized losses, drug bore, horsepower, um, RPM. And um, to compute the mean, this code is basically computing the mean for normalized losses. And then we, after running this code, we discover that the average mean or the mean is actually 122.0. And then the next line of code is actually replacing um, the missing data in this particular feature normalized losses 
with this main. And then we are repeating the same thing for bore, for the feature bore. So we find the mean or the average, and then the next line of code is simply replacing it with the mean. All right, so we have another question here. So can you replace uh, the missing data in stroke horsepower and peak RPM columns by main? So if you can quickly do that and let me know in the chat box. So the question says to replace the missing data in stroke horsepower RPM, just um, the way we did for bore and normalized losses. So I'm looking out uh, for the chat box uh, to see if anyone has gotten it. Okay, all right, so to, re uh, to replace the main, uh, you simply, you can simply copy the code and simply edit it. So where you have normalized losses as above, you replace, you change it to stroke, do the same thing for horsepower and then peak RPM. And then we want to replace um, by frequency, in this case, number of doors. Now to um, see which values are present in that particular column, we use the value underscore count method. It will tell us the values that are present. So we, we only have two, two doors, which are two types of doors, which is four or two. This is actually another reason why we have to use um, the frequency instead of using mean like the others to replace um, the number of doors. So you can discover that four doors are 114 and two doors are 89. And then uh, we want to know or to calculate the most common type automatically. And the most common type automatically is four. That is another reason why we are replacing with uh, mode or frequency and not main. And then we simply replace the missing values, uh, the missing data with four. So since four doors is most frequent, it is most likely to occur when it comes to prediction. And then we are dropping the whole row. We want to predict the price. So we simply delete um, the whole row. And then we, we use the, the drop NA to um, delete the whole row. And then this code here is simply resetting um, the index. Now, after doing that, we want to look at our data, the first five rows of our data to uh, be sure uh, data looks fine before we continue. So looking at our data, everything, all missing values are now um, filled up or replaced. Now, the next thing is we want to list data types for each of the column, just to be sure that each column have the correct data type. And then we use um, those D types to do that, to list the different data types of the column. Now, if you look at uh, uh, um, data type, you discover that some data types do not have the proper format, okay? Like the bore and stroke, it is actually showing here that it's an object data type. But when you look at the data, it's, it's supposed to be um, a float data type. Normalized losses is meant to be an integer. So what we basically, what we are basically doing here is to replace or to convert the data types to the proper um, data types. So we do that for the ball and stroke normalized losses, price also. It's showing here that price is an object, but price is meant to be 
um, a float. So we convert it to float and do the same thing for um, peak RPM. And then we want to look at uh, data types to be sure that it's actually um, have the proper uh, format. Now, looking at the current data types, do you think there are any other variable that needs to be changed into numeric data type, either integer or float? Please um, drop your answer in the chat box. Looking at the current data type, do you think we have any other variable that needs to be changed to the correct data type, either integer or float? Okay, so we have fraud type to, okay, yes, um, number of doors, good, awesome. Horsepower, awesome, number of doors, awesome. Number of cylinders, awesome. Great, great. So you can actually um, try to convert um, them to their proper um, data types. All right, now, so um, having a basic understanding of uh, the different data types, we are going to summarize uh, our data. So using the dots describe function, it basically summarizes the count, the mean, standard deviation, the minimum, maximum for numeric variables. And then running this line of code, we can see the counts for each of the features, the mean, the, the, um, the minimum value, the maximum, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile, and so on. Now talking about percentile, percentile simply is the value below which uh, a percentage um, data or of data falls, the value below which a percentage of a data falls. In a data set, you can say that the, the P um, percentile is a value such that at least P percent of the values take on this value or less. Now, for example, to find the um, 80th um, percentile, you have to sort the data. Then starting from the smallest, you proceed 80% of the way to the largest value. Now, note that the median is the same thing as 50th percentile. So 50th percentile is the median. And um, sometimes um, a question arises, um, which is best in mean, median, and bold. So if we are having a categorical data, we can say that nominal or ordinal, or we can say nominal or ordinal data set. It becomes impossible to actually calculate the mean and mode. And in this case, it is best to calculate um, the mode. If you're having um, a categorical data, let's say nominal or ordinal data set, it is impossible to calculate the mean and median. So in this case, it's best to calculate the mode. But if we have like a quantitative data, then the best practice is to go for mean or median. And in this case, if the data has outlier, then the median is the best measurement for finding central tendency. So we can actually apply the described method on the different um, variable types. So even you're applying it on objects because it's an object data type, it's not numeric, of course, you won't see um, um, values such as 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile. And then when you apply it on floats, okay, you can um, see the counts, the mean, the standard deviation, the, the, the median, the 50th percentile, the 5th percentile, maximum and minimum numbers. Now, the next thing we want to look at is um, we want to check our data set if there are any duplicates. And running this line of code tells us if there are duplicates or not. And then, as you can see, we have no duplicate. This line of code actually returns zero. So there are no duplicates in our data set. 
Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a while and then um, hand over to Shavia for um, question and answer. So please, if you have any question and answer, we'll be taking question and answer here and Shavia will be um, hand, take over from here. Yes, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, we will have a five minutes to answer live any of the questions uh, you people have. Uh, Shavia, are you ready to take over? Uh, Rishika, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, I'm yeah. not so sure if Shavi is experiencing some technical difficulties. Shavi, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, yes, if you have any questions uh, regarding so much uh, of what Jane has taught us, uh, please ask us in the Q&A and uh, Shavi will be taking over uh, answering it. Shavia? Yeah, so the question is, when do we use mean, mode, and median? So median is usually used uh, when there are, we know that any column has a lot of, the variable has a lot of outliers. So we will go ahead and uh, look at the median of that variable to get an understanding how it is, what is the pattern and how, where are the values lying? What is the middle most value? Also for the missing values, we will replace with the median when we have a lot of outliers and not by the mean because mean is most affected by the outliers. If we have categorical variables, it's go, good to go ahead and look at mode, the frequency of uh, the occurrence of those particular categories and also in those instances where variable is categorical, we will definitely go ahead and replace those missing values by the mode of frequency. Thanks. Thank you. Also, a lot um, of question was asked about why do we need to replace missing values? And mm -hmm. I did answer and uh, other volunteers are in and Rishika. So our motive is to went to, to analyze like in the exploratory analysis, how our variables are. And these missing values are not able to give a good picture of how our variables are and how they can be affecting our response variables. So data modeling becomes a lot more difficult and a lot more bias is induced. So we need to replace the values, missing values to get a good data model. Thank you. Um, Brittany asks, uh, this is a really uh, great refresher. Uh, how much time would you say you usually spend during each step of the data science process, cleaning, EDA, and modeling? Uh, that's a great question, Brittany. Um, we, uh, so since we are talking about exploratory data analysis, uh, this is the first step to any machine learning project. So usually this takes up the biggest chunk of our time uh, when we start a machine learning project. Uh, I hope that answers you. Uh, modeling takes up about 20% of the time. Uh, validation and retraining the model again. So that part takes another 20%. Uh, but EDA definitely takes up about 60% of the time, mostly because the data is more raw and there's a lot of missing values, a lot of invalid entries. So it's a process of um, solving one by one and getting the uh, data. We call it golden data set in my company. So you get the golden data set after doing the exploratory data analysis where the data is raw and it gets transformed into a data set that you can use in machine learning. Um, next question. Um, how to tell if there's a lot of outliers? Um, so that is a good question uh, by CM. Uh, so 
usually you use a box plot or you can use uh, the interquartile range, which Jane is going to take in the next uh, section, which is exploring the data. So using that, uh, you can actually tell if there are a lot of outliers. And I'm sure Jane is going to take that topic next. Um, yes, uh, so the rest of the questions our panelists will be up, um, answering in the background. Uh, thank you for this. We also have another uh, Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. So we will make sure that all of your questions and doubts are answered. And you can take it away, Jean, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, moving ahead, we want to look at um, exploring our data sets. So this is particularly important when you want to understand how a particular variable um, is distributed in a, in a data set. And then we have different tools for exploring your data. We have a frequency table. So it's actually a count of the numeric values that fall into um, a set of int intervals, or you can call it bins. So this is an, um, a picture of um, a frequency table. We have um, age range and then the count. So what this means is um, between um, the ages zero to five, there are like 36 people, um, six to 10, there are 19 people, um, 71 to 75, we have like three people and so on. Another tool for exploring your data is um, the histogram. So the histogram is simply a plot of um, the frequency table with beans. So beans is actually like an interval of time. So you have beans on the X axis and then it counts on the Y axis. And a histogram is actually a great way to visualize uh, your frequency table. So data are built into intervals and heights of the bars represent the number of cases that fall into each interval. So histograms are actually very useful for identifying shapes of distribution. Now, when the width of the bin is wide, you might actually lose interesting details. And when it's too narrow, it might be difficult to get an overall picture of the distribution. So it's actually ideal you have like an equal um, width all through. So in plotting um, histograms, it is plotted generally such that the empty bins are included in the graph, uh, the bins uh, equal weight. Um, number of beans is, of course, it's up to the user. And the base are uh, no contains no space. It shows no space between the bars unless there is an empty bin. So this is actually um, a picture of a histogram. This is what the histogram looks like. So this histogram was actually plotted with this data in uh, this particular frequency table. Okay, so you can see that from zero to five, there are like 36 people here, just like the frequency table and, uh, and so on. Another um, visual is um, the density plot. So it's related to the histogram, but in this case, it's actually a smooth version of the histogram. So it shows the data distribution as a continuous line. So you can see it as a, a smoothed histogram. So this is actually um, a density plot that was still plotted from that frequency table. Now, another tool is uh, the box plot. You can also call it box and uh, whiskers plot. So box plots are based on percentiles and um, they, give, they give a quick way to visualize the data distribution. And um, it's actually a common measurement of variability, or it it shows the difference between. Okay, when we talk about variability, the difference between the twenty fifth um, percentile and seventy fifth percentile is called the interquartile range. The median, like I mentioned before, is the same thing as fiftieth percentile. Now I have an example. Let's say I have a data such as. Um, Okay, so I have a data such as, um, let's say um, one, two, three, three, five, six, seven, nine, 
something like that. Now the 25th percentile is going to be, um, oh, I think I need to type this so you understand better. Okay, let's say I have a data one, two, um, three, three, um, one, two, three, three, say five, six, seven, nine, five, six, seven, nine. I have a data like this. Now to get the, the, the um, first of all, we have to sort the data. So when you sort the data, Okay, it has already been sorted. Now the 25th percentile is at 2.5. Looking at this data, is at 2.5. And the 75th percentile is at 6.5. So to get the interquartile range, 2.5, 6.5, to get the interquartile range, you simply subtract 2.5 from 6.5. And that will give you the interquartile range. to box up and the bottom are referred to as whiskers. And they extend from the top and bottom to indicate the range for the bulk of the data. So looking at this data, this um, box plot, we have the median here at the middle. This point, the lower quarter, this is the upper quarter, and then you have the whiskers and then outliers. So what we are trying to do here is to um, use Hi, I think we are experiencing some, experiencing some technical difficulties. Please uh, give us two or three more minutes uh, for Jane to be back online. Yes, Jane is frozen, so we are experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, Uh, please take a five minute break as we try fixing this. Thank you.
Hello. Hi, Jane. Uh, you got disconnected. Please, uh, can yes, you quickly um, uh, share your screen and take over? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. And yeah, I think I was talking about box plots if I got disconnected. Yes, uh, I think, uh, yeah, you can start from the histogram plot here itself uh, because... Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. So um, histogram is actually a great tool to visualize. So what we're basically doing here is looking at the different, plotting the diff, um, histogram for um, the different features that we have in um, our data set. So um, a distribution is actually screwed if one of its tails uh, is longer than the other. Now this particular distribution here, um, it's actually this particular one that has to do with um, height. It actually shows that um, it has a positive skew. This means that it has a long tail in the positive direction. And um, the distribution on Okay, so even that of the um, of the price is actually positively screwed because it has um, a long tail in the positive direction. So for a perfectly normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode will be the same value, and is visually represented by the peak of the curve. Now, when it is positive, it shows, it indicates that the mass of the distribution is actually towards the left of the distribution and that the right tail is longer than the left one. So what we're, what we're basically doing here is trying to visualize for um, the, uh, the individual features. So this is for uh, like the stroke and um, we are, plotting the um, density plot for for the stroke Now uh, we want to look at the relationship between um, or using box plus to see how each of these variables uh, actually differ from the other or like their distribution. Now looking at this, we can see that the distribution price between the railway drive and um, other categories are distinct. So the price for the forward wheel drive and railway drive are almost indistingu indistinguishable. And here we see that the price between the drive wheel categories differs. So um, drive wheel could actually be um, a potential predictor when it comes to price. And then the next box plot, we are looking at body style. We want to tell if body style is a good predictor of price. And then we see that the division of price between the different body styles have like a significant um, overlap. And so body style will not really be a good predictor of price. Now let's um, examine the engine location and price. Now, the, now this is for engine um, location and price. Here we see that the distribution of price between these two engine location categories, front and rear, are distinct enough to take engine location as a potential good predictor of price. And then this is basically showing um, the box plots for all, um, all the features. Now the next thing we want to look at is exploring um, binary and categorical data. So for categorical data, simple proportions um, actually tell the story of the data. We've talked about mean as uh, the most frequent um, 
value in the data set. And then we'll look at probability. So probability is simply that the likelihood of an event will occur. And probability of an event is always between zero and one. So when we have P of A, this simply means probability of A. Now, an example is, what are the chances of getting three, whole, three um, heads, of getting heads three times in a row? Now, the sample space is actually a list of all the possible outcomes. Okay, so you, you can have, when you throw um, like a coin, you can have three heads um, in the first three throws, or you can get two heads and then one tail, or you can get one head, a tail, and a head, you can, or you can get a tail, head, head, and so on. So probability of getting three times in a row is actually one, because we have like eight sample spaces. So when you divide one by eight, it's like, um, 12.5%. Now, another quiz example is what are the odds that um, a pair of, that when you roll a pair of dice, you get like two um, sixes. So in a pair of dice, you have like the six outcomes. So this is like um, a sample space of a pair of dice. You can throw the pair of dice and for each of them you get one one or you get one two one three and so or you can even get six and six so giving a total of 36 as our total um, sample space and then what are the odds that when you roll a pair of dice you get two sixes and then looking at this sample space you can only get two ones which is one over 36. And that is how we got one over 36. And um, in probability, a random variable is the outcome or set of possible values of a random process. So when we toss a coin, we know that it can land on heads or tail, but we don't know which one. So random variables can either be discrete or continuous. And discrete can only take certain values while continuous can take any value. Now there are um, events when it comes to um, probability. We have independent events and then dependent events. Now two events are said to be independent if knowing the outcome of one provides no useful information about the outcome of the other. Looking at this diagram. Now knowing that the outcome uh, or knowing that the coin landed on the head on the first toss it doesn't provide any useful information for determining what the coin will land on in the second toss. So in this case, the probability of a head or a tail on the second toss is like 0 0.5, which is 1.2, regardless of the outcome of the first toss. On the other hand, knowing that the first card drawn from a deck is an ace, it does provide useful information for calculating probabilities of outcomes in the second row. So the probability of drawing yet another ace is going to be like three over 51 instead of four over 52 because you already drew one out of it. And so it's going to reduce the sample size. And then we have um, conditional probability so it's used to define probability between um, dependent events. So let's say you have two events, A and B, where A occurs before B. Conditional probability is used to calculate the probability of B occurring after A has occurred. Uh, so the occurrence of Jane, A- uh, sorry to interrupt. I think you're not sharing the right screen. Uh, we are seeing your PowerPoint presentation still. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right, sorry about that. So, uh, all right, so I was talking about conditional probability where the occurrence of A determines the occurrence of the other. So it's used to calculate the probability of B occurring after A has occurred. And the occurrence of A changes the probability of the occurrence of B. And this is like the formula for 
conditional probability. So we have a question like given a coin, what are your chances of getting two heads in the first two tosses? So for A is getting head on the first toss and B is getting head on second toss. Now this is like the sample space. So when you toss the first time, you can get a head and then the second time you can also get a head. When you toss again, you can get a head and then the second time you, you can get a tail. And then you can toss the third time, get tail and head for second time or tail, tail. Now the probability is going to be one over four because the question is what are the chances of getting two heads in the first two tosses now these are like we actually have like four here and then probability of getting two head is one so it's going to be like one over four and then the probability of getting um head on first toss is actually half which is one over two because you're only tossing it once. So it's going to be one over two. And then when you multiply 0 0.25, which is one, one over four by one over two, you get 0 0.125. So there is a 12.5% 12 12 chance of getting two heads on the first two tosses. Now, another example is what's the probability of getting a king after getting a queen from a deck of cards? Now, A is getting a king on first draw. The question says getting a king after getting a queen. So you have to get one first. Now, when you get a king on first row, we have like um, four kings and the total number of cards is 52. When you get a king, it's going to be like, if we divide four over 52, it's 0 0.077. And now the probability of getting queens after getting a king. Now, because we already have a, a, a king, we already drew out a card and we're not replacing it. So the sample space is going to reduce to 51. And since we have four queens, that is four over 51. And when you uh, divide this, you get 0 0.078. And then multiplying both, we have um, 0 0.006. So there's actually a 0.6% chance of getting a queen after getting a king. So when the categories can be associated with the numerical value, this gives an average value based on categories probability of occurrence. And then when it comes to binary and categorical data, we can use uh, pie charts to actually explore. Um, so this is actually like the frequency for each category plotted as wages in the pie. And then we can also use bar charts Bar charts actually looks like a histogram, but the difference uh, is that there are actually spaces between the bars. We have unlike that of a, a histogram. And then you can also use mode as, as, a, as a tool. And then we talk about expected value. So it's actually a special type of categorical data in which the categories uh, represent or can be mapped to discrete values on the same scale. Now, a question here is a marketer for a new cloud technology, for example, offers two levels of service. One is priced at 300 per month and another is 15 per month. So the marketer offers free webinars to generate leads and the firm figures that 5% of the attendees will sign up for the 300 service 15% for the 50 service and 80% will not sign up for anything. Now to get the expected value, you simply multiply each outcome by its probability of occurring and then you sum these values. This is actually um, showing how to calculate the expected value. So we have um, each of the um, sample and their probability. So you simply multiply this, that's 300 by 0 0.05, 50 by 0 0.15, and then 0 0.80 by nothing. And then you get 22.5. And that is how we, uh, we find um, expected value. So we have to multiply by um, zero because 80% will not sign up for anything and that is zero. And then this is the same calculation. 
Okay, and um, we want to look at um, correlation. Correlation is simply a measure of the extent of interdependence between variables. So in other words, we want to see how the features depend on the variable, which is price. Then this can be able to tell us which is actually a good predictor. And scatter plot shows how much variable is affected by another. The relationship between two variables is actually called their correlation. So looking at this diagram, it actually tells how to understand correlation. So when um, the price, let's say in this case, the price is actually going high and one of the features is actually going high, we can say that it has a perfect positive correlation. And to get correlation for each of um, the features, we use this particular function to get the correlation. Now let's understand relationships between these variables. And we're going to be using a scatter plot to visualize and tell if each of these features can be able to predict the price of the car. Now we have price and engine size. Now looking at the scatter plot, you can see that as the engine size goes up, the price goes up. This indicates a positive direct correlation between these two variables. So engine size seems like a pretty good predictor for price. Since the regression line is like almost a perfect diagonal line. Now let's look at the next um, variable, which is highway. Let's see if highway is a potential predictor of price. Now, looking at this um, scatter plot, we discovered that as the highway um, MPG goes up, the price um, actually goes down. Now, this indicates an inverse or negative relationship between these two variables. So we can also say that highway could be a potential predictor of price. Now, let's look at um, peak RPM and see if it's a good predictor of price. So peak RPM does not seem like a good predictor of price at all, since the regression line is close to horizontal. Also, the data points are scattered and far from the fitted line. Therefore, it is not a reliable variable. And then let's look at stroke, if it's a good predictor of price. So we can see that there's actually a weak correlation between the variable stroke and price. As such, regression will not work well. And then the next thing we want to look at is um, plotting um, a heat map. So basically, the heat map is just um, showing the values we actually got in um, using the correlation function. So each square shows the correlation between the variables on each axis. And correlation ranges from minus one to plus one. Values clear to zero means there is no a linear trend between the two variables. And the values close to one, the correlation is more positively correlated. That is, as one increase, so does the other. And so closer to one, it actually means it has a strong correlation. So a correlation closer to minus one is similar. But instead, but instead of both increasing one variable, but instead of both increasing, one variable will decrease as the other increases. Now the diagonals are all dark blue because these particular squares are correlating each variable to itself. So it's a perfect correlation. For the rest, the larger the number, the darker the color, the higher the correlation between the two, between the two variables. So stronger correlate relationships are represented by values in the heat map that are closer to negative or positive one. And weaker relationships are represented by values that are closer to zero. So now we have a better idea of what our data looks like and which variables are important to take, to take into account when predicting the car price. And then we have narrowed it down to the following variables. 
So under continuous numeric values, we have length, um, width, the curb weight, engine size, horsepower, city MPG, and so on. And under categorical variables, we have the drive wheels. So after this exploration, fitting the model with variables that meaningfully affect our target variable, we actually improve our model's prediction performance when it comes to machine learning. So at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to Shavia. Um, she'll take it up from here on contour plots and hexagonal binning. Hello, thanks Neha and Jane. Um, thanks Jane for a wonderful update through the exploratory data analysis. I will start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, we will talk about contour plots and hexag hexagonal binning plots. Um, we start with contour plots. Contour plots um, are a plot where we are essentially trying to represent three dimensional on a two dimensional surface. So and there are it's actually the these plots are the function of two variables and in such a manner that the two variables are presented on x and y axis respectively and the the function of those variables is repre represented by the contours or the slices and these plots are very useful when we are trying to obtain interaction among variables especially very useful in geospatial data where we are trying to represent the function of two variables over a surface. Since we have a very different kind of a data set here and we are analyzing automobile data set, we can take another situation where we can utilize these contour plots. Let's say we want to understand the distribution of the data variables, for instance, engine size and highway. So if here we want to see, uh, we can do, do it by using the KD plot. It is a function which can be found in Seaborn library in Python. So we try to get the density estimate, that is the probability density function and representing it by the contour plots here. So why do we do this? Uh, maybe we want to understand the distribution of our data within a particular subspace and trying to compare it to some kind of a reference data set or another kind of a sample data set. We can go ahead and actually add a descriptive value to the similar uh, contour graph by setting the color bars so that for each contour, we can actually capture the intensity and importance. So here we can see by using certain arguments, we can actually obtain a contour plot like this, where the darker region often represents the higher density values. So now um, we can look upon how we actually utilize these plots. So as I mentioned before, these are mainly used for geospatial data because very they are very useful when we are visualizing these any surface surfaces. So we can say that the distribution of these con contour lines are such uh, that it actually represents how we are changing across the surface. So let's go ahead and look into an example. Here, our objective is uh, visualizing two South American mammals, namely brown sloth and a forest small rice rat. So we, you can actually look into the data set in this library. And so the objective here is to study these species in geographical distribution, which is very important for a biology conservation biology area. So if we plot these two species, the map will look like this. So 
I think the purple here is for the brown sloth and the red is representing the forest moth. So we can see that this map does not actually give a good idea of the spread of the species around the South America, because not only because the two species points are overlapping, but the individual species points are also cluttered. You may not be able to realize, but we are actually plotting about 1600 data points here. So if we utilize the counter plots here and we will get the maps like this for individual species. And now we can see that we can actually through this map analyze where there are more densely located these kinds of species across the South America map. So very useful when we are looking at the geospatial data, but we can also use contour maps or plots to even visualize the error surfaces in the machine learning uh, algorithms. So in machine learning algorithms, we typically look at the optimization techniques. Very popular is gradient descent. So in that cases, we can actually make a counter plot between the errors and the weights, and we can visualize that how we are actually learning the path to our minima, global minima. Counter plots are also important when we are trying to plot the decision surface or visualize the decision boundaries in our classification models. For example, say in K nearest neighborhood, we are fitting a model on a training data set and making prediction over a set of values. And if you want to get the decision surface, the counter plots are very important. So now we move over to hexagonal binning. Hexagonal binning plots are very important when we are able to represent, uh, we, are, we want to know the relationship between two variables and we have a lot of data point. So when we uh, want to analyze the relationship among two variables, we usually look at the scatter plots, but sometimes scatter plots can be messy. And this could be due to a lot of overlapping and cluttering happening of the points happening at a particular area. So what we do essentially is plot by, we do plot windows and split it in these several hexagons. And in each hexagon, we are counting the number of points. It does look like a heat map when we plot a hexagon in winning plot. So let's go ahead and see a scatter plot between the horsepower and RPM. And we can analyze by seeing this scatter plot that there is a lot of overlap happening on this area. And it is definitely hard to analyze and draw a conclusion about the relationship between these two variables. So we go ahead and draw a hexagonal plot between the horsepower and the RPM and to, just to analyze where most of our points lie. So if we go ahead and run this, we will get this kind of a plot. So we can see that this is more effective in visualizing that between a particular ranges of horsepower and RPM, we have more number of points and somewhere we, we, you, we don't even have a lot of points. We can actually go ahead and add another, go ahead and make this plot more, more sensible by adding the variable by which we are counting the number of points in a hexagon to another variable. So let's say we want to analyze the relationship between horsepower and peak RPM, but now we will plot these hexagon bins by, by accumulating the values of a variable, say price. So we can go ahead and use this function, plot hexagon and pass a C argument of price. And we can get this graph. 
and see we can see this is very different from the up in the bar graph we got above because here the values in each heads of bin is accumulated by price even experts say that hexagonal binning plots are used in geographical maps yes they are very important even in those areas but we can also use in use them in situations like this where we are able to plot three variables and see their relationship so yeah uh, thank you everyone i will open the floor for question answer sneha Yes, thank you, Shavya. That was a great uh, uh, intro into contour plots and hexagonal bending. Uh, if you would stop, uh, stop sharing the screen, I can just take over. Uh, so we have reached uh, time here. We are running a little late, so we're going to have uh, the Q&A session cut short, mostly because our team, Rishika, Aryan, and Shavya has um, done exceptional job answering to all of your questions. Uh, I noticed that there were a lot of uh, questions on distribution and if it's a left skew or a right skew. Uh, all those questions are being answered in our next session. Uh, so in our next session, we have a dedicated topic just uh, for uh, the distributions and how to interpret them to understand if they are left skewed or right skewed. So all those things come under the distributions and central limit theorem. So stay tuned for that in our next series. Um, yes, so that's where we are uh, come to. Uh, just can... Yes, uh, so I just want to extend a big, big thank you to Jane. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I hope you guys uh, took a lot of information and uh, you have the notebook, so please feel free to run the notebook, experiment with it. You also have the data. Um, and thank you, Shavya, for the wonderful uh, presentation on contour plotting. Uh, so this is only a basic uh, introduction, just because uh, contour plotting and hexagonal binning. Hexagonal binning, uh, I can see that a lot of people are saying how informative that was, but with contour plotting, it's usually done in geospatial data. So it's more advanced than what we are trying to do here. So we will cover those in the following webinar uh, series for sure. Uh, but other than that, uh, the, our next series is based on data and sampling distributions where you all the questions that you had today on distribution will be answered. So please, uh, um, if you have registered for the webinar, uh, you are registered for all of the webinar in the series, and uh, the next one is on February 13th, the same day and same time, and it will be taken by Ravi Bansal, and he has been a teacher teaching Python and data science uh, for a long time now, and I'm sure his, his is going to be entertaining as how Jane did it today. Uh, another um, um, in, a reminder to join Women Who Code Data Science Career Track. Uh, you have a lot of benefits of like having a community of women supporting you, and we have so many other resources available for you as well. So Aryan would be sharing link to Slack and all the other communities' uh, social media handles, and please feel free to join them. And if you have any more questions, please uh, don't hesitate to reach any to any one of us uh, through Slack. Uh, and thank you. Uh, we had a wonderful time and we hope to see you again next week.